Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. If you've had trouble breathing lately, it may be because the air is polluted with xenophobia. Almost every day, we hear one presidential candidate or another spew vile comments about Muslims, Mexicans, or Syrians who are fleeing the carnage in their country. Maybe history can remind us why racism never ennobles. In 1942, this country forced Japanese Americans out of their homes into concentration camps. Madeline Sugimoto was one of them. She was five years old. Her story and its lessons, next. I am honored to welcome to this program Madeline Sugimoto. It's nice to see you. Thank you for inviting me. What happened in 1942? Where were you and your family? It was you, your mother, and your father, right? Yes. And, and where also, were you living? We were living in the San Joaquin Valley, which is central California. So, and uh, it's primarily an area that uh, has, has and continues to be uh, where the farmers right. are producing fruits and vegetables that supply a large percentage to the United States. So we were living in that uh, area and uh, with my grandparents and his generation that first uh, moved into that area and started farming. So it was a very uh, comfortable community that was uh, starting out at that time. And what happened? How did the word come that you and the others had to leave and had to be sent to camps, concentration camps? Well, there was a, a posting of um, an executive order, 9066, which said that all of those of uh, Japanese ancestry were to be removed, evacuated out of the area. And primarily, it would be the western coast area, right. which uh, could is... California, but also um, Washington, Oregon, and even parts of Colorado. So it was the... When you say posting, what, what do you mean? There was, well, there it was were, in the there newspapers, were, or it was... No, there were actually um, papers uh, that had information regarding the executive order and saying that once this was posted in your community, you had 48 hours in which to be prepare because you were going to be leaving your homes and moving into other areas that have to do with um, moving the Japanese and right. Japanese Americans out of the area. Now, for our audience, somewhere between 110 and 120,000 yes. Japanese Americans, 62 percent of them who were citizens of the United States were sent to camps. Now, that's an awful lot of people. How did they, let's just bring it down to you and your family, how did they find you, or how did, you, how did they know to come and get you and take you away? Well, once the posting was placed in the city or the, the uh, area, then the Japanese and Japanese Americans knew that we were to be um, evacuated. And the word got around very quickly, and it was within 48 hours, so it meant it was a very short amount of time in which the posting was placed in the city or the town, and then the rest of us as community got to hear about it and uh, quickly had to uh, prepare and uh, do some packing. So were you, did people come to your house? Did authorities come to your house? Or it's just that you and others just... Uh, obeyed the posting and went off. How, yeah, how did that we, work? We all knew that there was, it was going to be happening because there was curfew before that. Mm -hmm. So that all, all of us had to be in the house and, and by uh, 9 p.m. and not be walking around the community or outside. So there was a sense that something was brewing at the time. And then when the posting came, it was almost uh, a sense that uh, something was going to happen and it was happening and that's how we found out that we were to be prepared to make sure that we would um, be within 48 hours in a specific right. area in the town. 
I see. With our pack. You were pack. five years old. Mm -hmm. Did you understand what was happening? Did your parents say something to you, tell you why you were leaving your home and going somewhere else? No, it was something where I don't really remember ever hearing anything. It was just that they were packing and we were going to go, and it included my grandparents, and it just uh, was something that I went along with as a child, and I think the fact that I was with my parents, you trust them to do whatever it is that's necessary. You don't even think about it as a child. But surely, you know, even at five, it's a young age, but but you must have had friends in the community, and, and, and now you're being asked to live your, leave your house. You had a house or an apartment? Yes, it was a regular a house. house. Uh -huh. You're being told to leave your house, uh -huh. pack up belongings, and go somewhere else. Surely you yeah. must have wondered what was happening. Well, it was not really something I, I remember as being um, an event that I would remember. It, you know, you have, as a child, you have these fleeting moments of certain right. experiences, but it's not really clear and it's not chronological. So one of the things I remember is that um, we were uh, sitting at picnic tables and really uh, enjoying ourselves. And uh, so I said to In my, your home community. Yes, in the yeah. community. And I said, oh, this is really, the food was very good and I was having a good time with my friends because it was a community gathering, I thought. And then my, uh, I said to my mom, well, when are we going to be going home because it's get, uh, getting late? And she said, we're not going home. And it turned out that actually this, that was the beginning of our being gathered together in what they call an assembly center so that the Japanese Americans and Japanese, uh, my grandparents too, were all there and I thought it was a picnic because we were sitting outside at these uh, little tables and eat, enjoying the food and it turned out to be the beginning of our actual evacuation. Where were you sent? Where was the, the camp? Uh, the place was called the Fresno Assembly Center and it, uh, I think... But I mean after that, into the, into the first oh, concentration. Camp? That was, uh, oh I would say probably about uh, I shouldn't say time frame because it's very difficult to remember that, but um, shortly after we were in the assembly center, then I remember sitting with my parents in the train, and uh, it, it was many, many days that we were in the train. We were allowed to get out and walk along the side of the train for stretching our legs, but basically I think it was about three days mm -hmm. of being on the train, and then we ended up in Arkansas. Really? So you so, so they, you were sent from California. the San Joaquin Valley of California yes. to Arkansas. To Arkansas. Into a camp that had what? Fences and barbed wire and, barbed wire. and guard towers. And it was um, uh, divided into blocks. So you might have maybe um, 20 barracks with them. In the center would be the mess hall and the community um, activities area. You say Washington. barracks. So. Uh, the mental picture I'm getting is like an army base and, and you and your family had to live in what, open barracks? It, it was in barracks that had about maybe um, six, six units in which um, there would be enough room in each of the units for about six people. But if the family was larger than six, then they were given other units within the same barracks. Um, but it was not connected. You had to go in through s separate entrances. And, and you lived in these barracks. Uh -huh. it, was, it was what, uh, uh, cots, beds, uh, and uh, one yeah. after another? Or? It was uh, barracks were covered with tar paper and it was just uh, wood inside of the, the way that it was constructed. And the, uh, we had uh, cots with um, mattresses that were made, uh, I remember, uh, the, at the beginning at the assembly center where the adults had to uh, fill the mattresses with straw so that we'd have uh, that cover the cots. Mm. And uh, what was, what was, what do you remember of the camps and, and what that experience was like? You spent, th what, three years? Three years, yes. Three years. Uh -huh. what, what was it like to live like that? Well, I would say as a child, as long as you're with your parents, and um, had friends, 
um, it was really, I, I don't think that much different than if we were not in a camp as a child. And one of the things is your friends were all around you much closer than if when we were in, in uh, living in Hanford because the barracks were all close to each other. So you had access to friends very, very easily. And we always had good time. So as a child, I don't remember it being anything that was sad or difficult. It was really fun. Mm. And the thing is, we were in That's Arkansas. That's so odd to hear, but I, I, I think, well, as you point out, you were five. Yeah. You know, so you have friends and you do things together. We had really wonderful times. In fact, it was uh, uh, probably a dangerous thing, but our parents didn't know. But we would um, sneak under the barbed wire fence right underneath where the guard tower was, because that way the MPs, the military police, wouldn't see us. And then we'd sneak outside and go into the areas that were actually swamps mm. because Arkansas is a very humid yeah. and, and uh, country with a lot of uh, swamps and water. And we had a good time just hopping around and outside of the, the camp and then sneaking back in again. And of course, our parents might have known, but they didn't say anything. But we, we were really outside in a dangerous area because uh, if you're beyond the barbed wire fence then you you know you're outside the right, area sure. that you should be did your did your uh, there were schools there, yes there the, were the uh, barracks there was a separate block which was designated with barracks that are just like the rest where we live but they were divided into classrooms so we had regular school mm -hmm. and i would say coming back from coming into New York City where we relocated at leaving the camp is that the school system was very good because I went into the, the uh, grade school in, here and had no difficulty in doing whatever was required at that particular grade. So I would say our school system and whatever we were learning were as good as those on the outside of the camps. Hmm, very interesting. Your father was an artist, a painter. Yes. And he painted in, uh, obviously before the camp, but yes. he painted in the camp. Yes. And many of his paintings uh, from the concentration camp days mm -hmm. uh, have just a tr tremendous poignancy to them. I'm thinking of one uh, that I've seen called Protecting the Flag. Yes. Describe that painting. And he painted this in, in the camp in Arkansas, right? Oh, yes. Well, there was a, a sense that we were Americans. And so uh, this is digressing a bit, but we had um, Boy Scout troops and Girl Scout troops. And in the camp. Were, in the camps. And they were, uh, there are some illustrations where they were holding up the American flag and having their little get together. So, um, you know, as I said, for the children, life was very much quotes like it probably would be outside the camp because you had friends, you had all these different activities and you had playtime, you had school. So your life was very much like I would imagine it would be if you weren't in the camp. And your father painted. Yes. And this one particular painting, Protecting the Flag, is so, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting commentary on the attitude of the people, many of the people, uh -huh. in the camp, because it shows, uh, I think, three or several young men in uniform, Japanese yes. Yes. boys, yes. Uh, in their in their scout uniform, uh -huh. protecting an American flag yeah. from some angry. Uh, w w what do you remember? At, at that well, point? there would be uh, some people like the uh, Issei's, my grandparents' generation who were kind of caught in the middle because um, they weren't citizens, first of all, because they right. weren't allowed to be. And they had a, still a, a sense of connection with Japan and the Japanese culture. Yes. And so I think they were uh, really caught in the middle because um, they were living in America, yet their culture and, and their, the influence of the culture was strong for them. And so they were reacting in some ways to the fact that they were being put in the camps and yet still considered to be uh, Americans. Yes. Well, as I understand what I've read about that, that particular painting is that 
uh, there was some anger over some sort of an event in in that particular camp. Uh, it may have been the, a shooting or something of a of a of a, a resident. And some of the people in the camp were trying to attack the flag. And here were these Japanese American boy, uh, boys uh -huh. in their uniform yeah. protecting the flag. Yeah. I find that it, it's it, hard to imagine yes. that it, it's a confusion. I think of trying to be Americans and being pulled in different directions because there's a culture of, of the grandparents that's very strong also. Yes, so I of think uh, it was difficult to try to maintain some kind of stability and harmony because there were strong feelings that were resentment of being in the camps as well as the fact that um, uh, people like my Uncle Ralph who was in the army. Hmm. And, and defending the, the United defending States. Defending the United States. And the, I think the ironic part is that uh, he would come in his uh, United States Army uniform, have to uh, stop at the entranceway and meet somebody who was in the same uniform as he, he is so that he could come in to see us. Us, yeah, the, family. the family. You, talk, you have talked about how you remember this as a child, and your parents really didn't. Uh, talk to you much about it during those years. Later in life, as you're a teenager or later, when you talk to them about it and got a further understanding of how they felt and what that was all about, what, what did they say? I think it was very difficult for them to try to maintain some stability and harmony in the family when they were um, the Issei's, the first generation, and Issei's, my parents' uh, generation, and mm -hmm. those of us who were the American-born um, Sansei's, third generation. And I think that trying to maintain some kind of balance so that there would be an understanding of what they had experienced and how we were trying to um, become assimilated again into the uh, American community is something I remember um, as later on. It was not something that I ever heard or remember hearing about resentment or anger in the camp. And I think the adults were very careful to uh, maintain some kind of normalcy rather than being angry or having all these feelings that would be expressed in front of the family or especially in front of young children. people and children. A afterwards, Madeline, uh, as you became an adult and as you talked more with your parents about this. Can you describe the level of their, what, anger, the wounds, the scars they suffered from this? Yeah, I think that they really had the sense of having been humiliated and uh, being seen as the enemy, but there was a sense that we would not, uh, we would not forget this as an experience, even as a child, and that it was important to be able to go beyond that. You don't forget it, but you don't keep that as something that uh, makes you feel like a victim. And so the sense was that you were going to be good American citizens, contribute to the community, and, and live as Americans, regardless of whatever happened. So it's saying you don't forget it, but then you go beyond that. And I, that's the feeling that I've um, gotten all along is that it was a terrible, dis, uh, disgraceful, humiliating, and sad time. And so we, we can remember that. But on the other hand, not have it drag you down so that you feel that ever after you have to be constantly feel like a, like a victim. I think we were told to be good citizens and, and contribute to the life in this country by being educated and doing what we could with our own talents. Well, you certainly did much with your talent in, in the healthcare field and uh, became a professional, distinguished profes professional in the healthcare field. I, I just because I started this program talking about the, the xenophobia that's in the air yes. now, uh, I want to quote from the lieutenant general who was the head of the Western Command and in, t and in charge of moving people uh -huh. like you yes. out of their homes. And this is one of the things he said about it. We must worry about the Japanese until he is wiped off the map. Um, for those who don't know the history, finally the American government apologized in 1980. In 1988, President Reagan signed 
uh, legislation admitting that government actions were based on, quote, race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. It doesn't sound like enough, but given what you hear uh, in this presidential campaign, the slurs against, as I said, Mexicans, Muslims, mm -hmm. others, Syrians. Mm -hmm. Does it make you sad? Have we learned nothing from this experience of yours and all these other Japanese Americans? I think it's because it's such a long time ago that many of the people living now, the young people, don't really know about it. And they might be hearing pieces of information, but it's something that's really past history. And so it's difficult to really um, go back and say th this was a disgraceful time of the United States acting as they, it has. Because for these young people, they don't really know that kind of history. Well, it was, I think it's the philosopher Santayana who said if we, something to the effect if we don't know history, we're condemned to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your view, are we? Is the is the language that's in the air? Does it frighten you? Does it does it sadden you? What do you? Yes, it, it saddens me because it's as if all these things are being said for certain groups of people, and there might be some in the group that really do uh, anger the rest of the public. But it's just blaming a group of people for something that they're not really responsible for. And I think that's what's happening, that there are few people, maybe they're loners or people that uh, um, are angry in their own way. But it turns out that a lot of times their, their culture or their background becomes an, an, an issue when it might not be really the true issue at all, that they're just angry people and they're trying to take it out in, in ways that are disgraceful and hurtful for the rest of the, of the culture or the community. Do you, uh, have you been, maybe not these days, but in the past, have you been asked to um, speak about your uh, experiences in, in the hopes of educating others? Yes. Uh, what, what have you done in that? Yes. Uh, there um, was a time when uh, there was a, what was called the Japanese American National Mu um, uh, the Museum? Speakers, uh, no, the uh, Japanese American Citizens League. Oh, the Citizens League, The cha yeah. chapters had uh, speakers bureaus in which we would volunteer to and be willing to uh, talk about our own experiences because they were the actual experience rather than somebody talking about sure. it by having read it. And I've had a number of opportunities, not as recently, uh, but um, where I've gone to schools to talk about American history, which had to do with our experience. And uh, I have to tell you that, I mean, it's a long time since I've been in school, uh, certainly elementary school and, and high school. I don't remember being taught this in, in my history class in, in school, that what we did to I uh, think American citizens, many of them American yeah. citizens. I know that in some books they were showing maybe one little paragraph that had to do with this whole internment experience. And uh, probably it was the government who really didn't want this kind of thing being known. I'm about to say something I hope I, it doesn't come out the wrong way to you. But you use the phrase internment, and that's the phrase that's used. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's a euphemism. You were put into a concentration camp. Yeah. 110 or 20,000 Japanese Americans were put into concentration camps by our government. Mm -hmm. So I, I would prefer to use the term concentration camp. Do you mind that? No, and I think more and more, as people are studying history, are looking at it and actually saying it is a concentration camp, and I would certainly go along with it, that internment was a euphemism for something that was worse than what it really, um, what it really right. was, but it was not used. And now it's being used a great deal, and I have used the term when I've talked yes, about I it. Yes, I understand. Too. We're almost at the end of the program, and I hope I don't have to, to say this to people, but it's just occurring to me. 
this was done because the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and there was this feeling in the United States that Japanese Americans were somehow going to aid the enemy and so we had concentration camps. Um, I guess I didn't need to say that, but it, uh, we guess we should put things in context. But I, I, I want you to talk just for a second about there's the Japanese American National Museum, is it, and I think that's in is that in it's California? In, it's in Los Angeles, California. Yeah. Yes. What would people see there, and what could they learn by either visiting it or at least visiting it online? I would say they would learn a great deal because that's probably been the uh, place where people. Um, will understand hi history and American history and then the context of having the um, internment or Japanese uh, American concentration camps. There were 10 in the United States, so yeah. um, it was a large enough number and that uh, they would learn about the people who maybe have given oral histories and who also still are alive enough to be um, enough of them to be able to speak in different community organizations or whoever's interested. So I think it's still important and, and being continued. And maybe by visiting the Japanese American National Museum or at least visiting it online, people might learn, as you say, uh, uh, enough history to perhaps uh, regard what's being said in this presidential race and other places. Yes in a much different way, yes. might, might learn. It, it would give a background and some kind of foundation for some of the things that are going on now based on the fact that this had happened yes. in the past during World War II. Well, as I said, maybe people will learn a little bit further why racism does no, not and never ennobles us mm -hmm. as a people. Yes. Madeline Sugimoto, it is my pleasure to talk to you, and uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Japanese American community and its experience during World War II. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We will be back next week.